Good afternoon, everybody. Hello. Hello. How goes it? Great. Good. I'm just uh, getting my other screen here. Oh, the mute. Sorry, I'm just trying to open. Uh, go ahead, um, Rick. Have you had a chance to look at the minutes? I have for both the meeting of May 6th and May 13th. I had no changes. And if you have none, I would move to accept them as presented. And I will second that. Um, uh, is there all in favor, Rick? Aye. Andrew is aye, and the minutes are accepted. Department liaison reports. <clears throat> um, nothing new on the veteran services. The quarterly meeting next is September 10th. Um, on the police side, we have an item on the agenda further down. We'll leave that for now. Um, as I mentioned, town hall, we have a meeting next week scheduled with the uh, town uh, administrator and treasurer collector. Um, emergency management group, busy, busy people. Tom keeps uh, things moving. Uh, as people saw, he set up a display at the town meeting. Uh, he signed up 17 more people to the emergency blackboard communication system, which is uh, uh, very easy to do for anyone who um, goes to the town website and I think gets off the town clerk's page, um, but it will allow you to get uh, emergency messages. But Tom got 17 more people enrolled in that. He handed out 94 emergency information cards distribute a lot of publications um, on preparedness for emergencies. Um, he and the fire chief, John Taylor, have uh, begun planning for an emergency operations center rehearsal uh, for some time in early June, so that's coming up. Um, he's also had so much inquiry and so many irons in the fire, he's decided to do almost regular office hours on Mondays from noon to 4.30 um, at the uh, emergency uh, in, uh, management center, which is at the police station on the trail. So people that have anything of interest they need to bring can catch him in person there as well. Sounds great. Well, he sounds like he's been keeping himself busy. Yeah, for sure. Good. Anything else on your end? No, sir. All righty. Terry, anything for you? Um, nothing, nothing that's not listed on the agenda. Thank you. Okay. Um, and on my end, I have um, asked Lori to um, <clears throat> schedule us another arms or Pratt committee meeting so that we can, uh, so that we can move forward on the on the elevator project, um, grant seeking project. I think that's probably the highest item on our list there. Um, Rick, uh, there, is, there is an upcoming uh, Franklin Regional Transit Authority meeting. I've been going to those, but um, I've also been going to the FERCOG meetings in Bob's place. And I'm interested in continuing with the FERCOG when, when we do the reorganization, but I'm happy to share the FRTA if, uh, if you would like to take that one on for a little while and learn about our transportation system. Um, and uh, the reason I'm bringing it up is because I'm heading out of town that evening. And if you wanted to go to that meeting, um, if you are able to, I would um, send you the coordinates for that. Uh, when is that? It's this Thursday, the 23rd at four o'clock. But if this is too short, oh, you good. can do that? Sure. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. And I will forward you their um, materials and, and Zoom link and stuff. Um, can't remember, the, the FERCOG is, is hybrid now, so you can attend either in person or on Zoom. I'm not sure about the FRTA, whether they have an in-person component again or not. Okay. Um, but you can ask them if that interests you. Otherwise, you can just attend on Zoom. Terrific. Um, 
Great. Well, thank you for that. Um, Anytime. And then I guess the other things that I had regarding Memorial Hall and the Pocket Park, we can talk about when we get to that okay. point. Uh, well, I guess Memorial Hall is not on the agenda. So, Terry, I'll just ask you, um, did we get straightened out on the I, I'm sorry, I was out of town this weekend, so I haven't read my email. You may have replied to this, but um, did we get straightened out on the elevator protocol that you want? Um, it's fine to turn the light off in the elevator. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter either way, but the slot that the key was in was one that I wasn't even familiar with. Yeah, um, that was a new one for me because i I've never used that slot. so. I, maybe I don't know how that happened, but anyway, we'll we'll uh, try to keep tightening up our our Memorial Hall elevator usage protocols. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of different people managing those events, so it's not going to be a, a a simple uh, communication there. I but, might ask if I can get a second key so that one can stay in the lights and one can stay in the on and off switch. That so would that be great. So that you're not having to. Right. I'm afraid the key's going to get lost at some point and then we're going to be out of luck. Yeah. And we did at one point have those extra keys on the rings. And I don't know why we don't now. Yeah. I don't um, know either. All right. Well, anyway, that would be great if we could get another key. Um, well, we've got um, Natalie Blay coming to visit us at 545, but we can do a few things before then. Um, I think I'll wait on the RFP. Um, Police Services Advisory Committee representation, Ken Eisenstein. Ken has stepped forward for that. He has an expressed an interest in serving if the board will have him. That's wonderful. Yeah, I read his background and uh, uh, definitely sounds like a great addition for our at-large position um, from what I could ascertain. Great. Well, I'm in agreement, Rick. So if you want to move that. So moved. We accept Ken Eidstein as the at-large position for the Police Services Advisory Committee. Great. Eisenstein. Eisenstein. Yeah. What did I say? I'm oh, sorry. Steve. <laughs> sorry. <Yeah. laughs> my Stein and my Steen mixed up. Right. Uh, it might be Eisenstein. I don't know if that was it, but anyway. Um, <laughs> okay. I thought you knew. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm willing to, uh, to, to mangle people's names as well. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I will second that. If there's no further discussion, we'll bring it to a vote. All in favor, Rick? Aye. Andrew is aye, and Ken is our newest advisory committee rep that fills out our our committee yes fantastic Thanks. all right and we are on to the pocket park use that's, that's tabled until uh june oh 2nd. right well since we're on the pocket park terry i'm just curious do we have any further indication that the tech school might actually be doing something there they were working today they were, okay. Yes, and of course, they won't be back over Memorial Day. I think their goal is to still finish it before graduation. Okay. <laughs> good, good. Well, um, I was uh, I was thinking of congratulating them by, by modeling the leisure which we hope to uh, encourage once the pocket part, the, once the pavilion is increased, uh, is, is completed, so. I think they're uh, they're doing a good job so far in recreating there. <laughs> yes. Um, great. Oh, well, we'll we'll keep hoping that they that they uh, finish up. Um, and joint meeting with finance and audit tours. Where are we with that? I've thrown it out to the finance committee, and I have yet to hear anything. I'd rather wrap it up sooner than later. So I may just schedule the, the auditors to come in in June and tell the finance committee that's when the discussion is going to happen. Would that be at you, a regular meeting or? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, at a, at a board meeting. I would think so. I okay. Mean, that, well, that makes it easier on yeah. our end anyway. 
Um, do it. Great. I, I'm I'm in favor of that. Okay. Um, good. Um, and I'm I'm going to skip over the personnel policy just in case that's a longer conversation. Um, Brick and Feather Brewery regarding a one day liquor license. Who are who is the Brick and Feather Brewery? Well, Brick and are, Feather are in Turner's Falls, yeah. and they have an event at Apex Orchards. Okay. Uh, they've been there several years. Um, got a nice little uh, uh, sampling room. Uh, they're at the entrance to the bridge that goes over to um, Migratory Way. Okay. Uh, yeah, Migratory Way. Um, uh, this is pretty routine um, permit. Uh, for Apex, they've always uh, done a good job keeping things under control, and uh, I think this is one of two for them tonight. So um, I would be happy to move that we approve that permit. I'll second that, and um, if there's no further discussion, we'll vote. Rick? Aye. Andrew is aye, and that is approved. Uh, I'm sorry, what is the date on that one? August 31st. Okay. Um, and then we have a parade permit request for the 44th annual Bridge of Flowers Road Race on August 10th. Um, any discussion on that, Rick? No. Okay. That's a Saturday. Um, won't, shouldn't cause any problems. And uh, it's a big event for the town, has been for Decades, literally. Well, they've had 44 years to figure it out. So, <laughs> um, so I, would, I would move we approve the permit for the parade. Great. I'll second that. Um, and if there's no discussion, we'll bring it to a vote. All in favor, Rick? Aye. Andrew is aye. And the permit is granted. And Natalie is here. So we can return to our appointment calendar. And uh, welcome, Natalie. Good to see you again. Yes. <laughs> we, that's right. We last saw you at town meeting, I think. That's right. Uh, it was a uh, packed house. I was a really record breaking uh, yeah. turnout there for at least in the post COVID era. It was, uh, it was great. We've, you know, I have to say it's been good turnout in most of the town meetings that uh, that I've attended so far. So good. it's good. really it's, that's a testament to a civic engagement in the first Franklin district. <laughs> yes, people are getting back into the swing here after yes, yes. After our outdoor meetings there. Which um, were wonderful on their own. I'll tell you what, <laughs> it, 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 it was incredible to be at them all and just to be reminded of how beautiful it is here in yeah. Massachusetts. Yeah, we were, we've been lucky during the, the COVID outdoor meeting era that we generally had, yes. didn't, get, didn't get too rained out there, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. So what what can we do for you? Or so what? this is yeah, this is just uh you know annually I try to schedule time with each and every select board uh just to make sure that we do have time to catch up so that if there is anything on your minds that you want to draw to my attention that we have the time to do that. Uh it's really just an opportunity to to catch up, to answer any questions that you have. Um but again, just really setting aside the time so that we can connect at least once a year. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you for, yeah. for doing that. And um, I guess there are some subjects that were not were, are not cleared for public discussion yet. Is that correct? Um, yes. So we won't we will not okay. we will not go in that direction, I guess. So. <laughs> I'm glad that you said something because I was ready. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> um uh, Rick, do you want to do you want to lead off with anything that you have on your mind? My only comment is congratulations on uh, the effort you put in to represent Western Mass for sure. Um, the Greenfield Recorder bar barely puts out a publication without your name in it, um, so that we know what you're doing. Uh, and uh, so far, so good, doing a great job, and uh, I for one appreciate it. Rick? Thank you, Rick. I appreciate that, well, and thank you for serving. I appreciate your public service. Barry, anything on your mind? No, no. All right. Well, I've got a, I've got a few things in my hopper. Um, 
One, Natalie, is I'm sure you're probably aware of our capital campaign for the Memorial Hall Theater, which uh, we've had underway for, oh gosh, getting close to for over 25 years. We've been pegging away at things up there. But this, this year, we're launching a three-year capital campaign. We've, we've raised a, over a third of the funds in various state, federal, and local public funding. And we're kind of right now at the launch phase of a of the private side of the of the capital campaign. And um, our committee is meeting weekly. We've hired Joe Maddy to do architectural services for us. And kind of the next project, our first project that the town supported was was uh, overhauling the elevator, which was 25 mm -hmm. years old. And we completed that last fall. It's still a little bit finicky, but is uh, helping us stay, you know, return to service in, in opening the hall and using it. Um, and we're, Joe is helping us design sort of the second phase of the campaign, which is mostly focused on the, um, the seats and the floor and the ceiling. Um, so we're, we're in the midst of that piece right now and hope to get that out to bid with the funding that we've raised so far. And then um, we'll go into phase three as we as we raise further dollars. So at some point we'd love to, you know, when we get a little bit farther along in the design process, we'd love to invite you up there and show you what we're doing and and um, perhaps put in our bid down the road in a year or more for um, to see if you might help us, you know, on the back end of the campaign to sort of finish things up. Um, you've been good at that and clean up on projects <laughs> for us. <so. laughs> well, I have, I have to say, I know you've all been working on, on those improvements for a very long time. And yes. you've been so smart in how you've chipped away at it over the years and taking care of, of what you could when you could. So congratulations, it's really- Oh, well, thanks, thanks, yeah. And then um, the- uh, what is the other, uh, the only other thing that, um, oh, I had another thing on my mind, but it, uh, well, the other project that we are um, in the midst of an undertaking that uh, just wanted you to know about, um, we're going in for, I think, one-stop engineering services um, this spring to hire an engineer to help us design specs to replace the uh, equipment in our sewer district pumping station, which is mm -hmm. a fairly big ticket item for a small district. So we're we're really hoping that we can put together a good project and get grant funding to so we don't have to put a big burden on the on the sewer ratepayers. Um, but that's a project that that equipment is decades old and and uh, is is in need of replacement. And from what I hear with the Biden infrastructure funding that there is now sources of funding for that sort of thing. So um, we just wanted you to know about that as we're as we're trying to move that project forward as well. Um, yeah. And Terry knows how to find me, but we you know, certainly be happy to write a letter of support when you submit that application. Yeah, great. Um, <laughs> Those are those are two of the the bigger and oh and then the other project that we're starting to cast around um, for funding we I don't know if you were at the town meeting when we approved this warrant item but we did approve I think fifty five thousand dollars for the replacement of the elevator the Lula the lift in the in the Arms Library which is also several decades old and on its last legs. Um, so we're now in the process of casting about for uh, funding sources that can uh, match or supplement the money the town has put in um, and hope we can do that while the elevator still lives. So, um, <laughs> so that we're not stuck in a big crunch there. <laughs> But we have at least gotten out a little bit ahead of it at this town meeting, and um, I'll be meeting with Lori over the next month or so to begin the the grant seeking process there to see what we can, what stones we can turn over. 
Um, so there was 55,000 committed. So that is the total project cost 110? I, I think so. Yeah, that's a sort of a rough, uh, that's an estimate at this point, but okay. um, we haven't, we haven't designed that project, but that's what we think is the ballpark of what it will take to replace that. Um, yeah, when you get that final project costs, you know, let me know and yeah. we keep an eye out for any grant funding or for improvements like that. Yeah, great. Um, but those are those are the things that I have on my list, and uh, we'll let you know if we come up with other ones too. <laughs> I, I appreciate that, and yeah, you know, I just want to say it's it's incredible working with you all, and um, it's a real pleasure to be able to pick up the phone and call Terry anytime <laughs> I need anything or uh, have some information to share. So uh, Terry, thank you for, for your partnership in this work. Um, just a couple of things that I wanted to flag for you all. You, the house just went through the FY25 budget process. Um, you know, I was able to get $25,000 directed towards the Mary Lyon Foundation which Wonderful. as you all know, is just doing tremendous work across the region. Uh, we were also able to get to direct 25,000 to Mohawk uh, to be able to continue the sustainability work uh, that they're doing with the study. And that's probably one of the, the biggest things that I've been working on the legislature since I first came in office is increasing rural school aid uh, and trying to get some additional assistance for our local schools because it is something I hear about at every town meeting and in pretty much every conversation uh, with our select board members. Uh, the house budget uh, does have additional funding for per pupil minimum aid. And it will, if it moves forward, so the Senate is taking up their budget this week, and then we'll have to conference the house and the Senate budgets together. Uh, but in the house, uh, we did provide an additional 74 dollars per pupil in minimum aid, which will increase the minimum aid total to $104 per pupil. So that's a significant increase that should be helpful. Um, and it did include the $15 million for rural school aid. I know that there's an effort to try to get that up a little bit. Um, so those are a couple of things that, that I've been working on in terms of education. And just because I know that you were impacted by storms, not really this past July, but what, about a decade ago? Um, you know, we did, Comerford and I worked together uh, in, in recognition of the fact that Massachusetts is one of only two states in the nation that does not have a disaster uh, relief fund. So we did propose that legislation in November. It was included in the governor's budget and the creation of the fund with $14 million has been uh, created in the house budget. So again, we'll have to get that through in conference, but having that funding in place for future disaster relief, um, rather than having to rely on the legislature being in session or budget bill moving uh, will be critically important. So that was a big win and it will be really good for our communities, especially given the damage that we saw this last summer. So those are just a couple of things I wanted to flag for you today. No, thank you very much. And I'm just a, out of curiosity then, the the funding you were successful in, in bringing last year when we had the agricultural damage from frost and flood, um, that was kind of a one-time deal or? Yes, yeah. Okay, so. We were able to secure the funding for farmers and then we were able to secure the additional money for the municipalities who were impacted. Uh, there was $15 million for municipalities. Right. Yeah. And so the, 14 million is a well, it's a start. It's not quite as much as I'd hoped for, uh, but it is a good starting point and we'll keep building on that. Yeah, no, it's good to get a stake in the ground and probably the you know upcoming weather patterns will will inform your future efforts there in terms of what scale of, of disaster we're talking about. You know, fingers but, crossed we don't have a summer like we did last year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no, that's that's very appreciated. And just to go back to the school one, I know you've been very active in the Rural School Commission. Does the, did the House pass the fifteen million or or not? That so in the House, so in the House budget, the Rural School Aid it was actually cut from fifteen million dollars to seven point five million dollars. The Senate was able to bring that back up to fifteen million dollars, which is what they're considering this week. I see. So if it's conferenced, you might get 15 or somewhere in, in the middle. I think, or... I, think well, I, I 
can never say anything with absolute 100% confidence, but I am fairly confident we'll be able to keep that at the $15 million level. Good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's been a, a big help for Mohawk, certainly. And uh, I know, and they've been tremendous leaders. You know, both the students and the administrators uh, and parents have been incredible advocates at the statewide level uh, in support of you know the the omnibus bill that we put forward, and then the funding uh, in the budget as well. Great. Well, those are great initiative, Nat Natalie, and, we, and I second Rick's uh, kudos there that you, we really appreciate your efforts on all those fronts, and you've been doing a tremendous job there. Thank you. It was good to see you all. I hope you have a good rest of your meeting. Um, I'm sure I'll see you in Shelburne Falls at some point in the near Sounds future. Good. All right. All right. Take care. Thanks, Bye. Natalie. Bye. <clears throat>
um, and then build that time into when we start the 30 days. Does that make sense? Well, it won't really interfere because um, for the purchase from Eversource, we have 101 lights in town. Even if we want to remove them, we have to do that purchase. And so that's built into our um, proposal. They were originally saying that it was about 14,500 for all our lights. So um, that won't change. Even if we want to remove lights, unfortunately, we still have to buy them to remove them, which is really crazy. Oh, that's what all the time. <laughs> that, that's new information for me, because last right. time we, you and I spoke, I thought we were going to be able to purchase a smaller number of lights if we could de decommission some of them. No, so it doesn't help us at that end, but it, but what it will help us with is we won't have to purchase the equipment to put back up. So we would basically be just taking the, the stuff off. We still have to pay someone to take it off, basically. Okay, so the but, decommissioning is is not going to impact the purchase no. process. So, so we should go ahead and move as quickly as we can at getting Eversource to, to if there's such a thing as quickly with Eversource, but uh, <laughs> we'll try and move as quickly as we can at doing the purchase and sale and getting that in line. But we can start that, and it won't it won't trigger anything as far as that goes because we. Right, right. right. I had a call. I, I did put a call into Esther Bolladeri at Eversource this afternoon. Um, I realizing it was the last minute and was hoping that she might be able to get it back to me. But that was one of the questions I wanted to clarify with her is what is their process compared to the um, purchase and purchase and sale type agreement. Um, so I think we can defer that um, or, you know, for two weeks until we know what the actual information is, if you're comfortable with that, or again, signing that agreement. There's pieces that need to be filled in there as far as who's gonna be the contact that will be working with Eversource um, to be the contact person for that, which rolls back kind of over to the RTE contract, which also said that they would help to negotiate that for us if that's what we wanted. So I think that is just another part of the discussion that needs to be that needs to be had. It sounds like it would be prudent then to do what you're saying, John, and to finalize the this and not start the clock ticking until we have confirmed information on all that. Two weeks is not going to make a big difference. Um, I know that RTE probably is anxious to hear back from us. But until we have that final IGA report that we're comfortable with, I, I think we should hold off agreeing to sign or just make that decision. Uh, I think in the long term, it makes sense to me and to the committee to just go ahead and use them as the main installer. They already have uh, sent out uh, Quotes, uh, not quotes. I'm sorry. They they did the bidding. They did a bidding process. They've selected a contractor to actually begin the work once, once the button is pushed. And um, although we had some minor issues with communication around this IGA report, for instance, um, they've been very responsive to what we've been needing. And they were our had already gone out to bid before we asked requested them to use or consider hiring local contractors. Their recommendation was, um, since they've already been through that process, to wait for the two years that the contract covers for maintenance and then hire a local contractor to do the maintenance going forward. Okay. And Terry, do you have more to add in terms of the procurement requirements for how we work with RTE going forward is that is the next phase of contracting such that we would have to go out to bid or can we continue to work with the the bid that we've already made we can continue to work with it's all included in the original contract that was signed okay and yeah, they are exempt from the procurement process i think what are they called srec company yeah, they're they're the state approved contractor. Okay. I don't think when Bob signed the contract originally, he realized that it was actually in all inclusive. Okay. Uh, though we told him it was only for nine thousand dollars at the time, 
Uh, there is a buyout or a, a write-off, not a write-off, a termination clause in there that we could terminate that contract with written notice. And that's why now would be the time to decide whether or not to continue with that contract or to terminate. And I don't personally, I think Jeff and committee agrees, it makes more sense to continue with the contract. We've looked at the pricing that's in there. We're trying to get clarification on a couple of uh, pricing pieces in regard to shielding on some of the fixtures, those type things. Um, but we're fairly comfortable that they included all the costs in their original price of $57,000 or whatever that number is. Okay. Rick, do you have any concerns about continuing onward with RTE? None whatsoever. And uh, if you'd like to wait two weeks before we make that official, uh, that's fine with me. Okay. I think that that's two separate things. Oh, RTE, you're going to work on right now? Yeah. I mean, it, it, we just need to let notify them that we're going to continue with the contract. Um, and, or, and I think the Eversource contract is a different, that's the different thing that should wait two weeks. You just well, need I, a vocal approval or do you need a vote? I don't think I don't think you need a no. vote. Okay. Yeah, I'm 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 with Rick on moving forward as we go. So um, I can there. also help you with the poll hearing. Um typically they're held in a select board meeting. Yeah. So if you give me the poll numbers and enough information, I can pull the legal notice together for you. We can okay. do them in a batch. Say again? Yeah. yeah. And we do them in a batch because I thought you had like seven or something you want to get rid of. Yeah, but yeah, I you list them. them. One, boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Great. Jeff, I think your, your volume is down, Jeff. Could you? Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. Yeah, we can okay. do it as a batch, but that's not. Right, well, I, the only other question the committee had is whether or not we actually have to notify the abutters that we're doing that. I'd have to go back through the file. Um, I know it's a it's a legal public notice, and if the committee wants to go to the extent, if it's not required of notifying butters, you're more than welcome to. Okay. I would recommend it just yeah. as a general process of sure. you know setting a setting the the template down of how we're going to proceed as the owners of our own lighting system. Sure. I think I think that would be a very yeah. community spirited way to begin absolutely yeah I'm, interesting I'm happy enough we did have story. one one person that come forward and ask if they could add a light on their street so that would be another discussion at, yes at another select board meeting i suppose but um that's that's also a possibility that one or two people may say can i get a light I think I know exactly who you're talking about, John. <laughs> I'm glad you do because I didn't get their name. Is that Rick. you, Rick? <laughs> no. <laughs> I think it's no. Rick's house. Yeah, a really great one. Yeah, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Uh, so, deciding to move forward with RTE is that thus for next week on the EverSource letter that they would be named as the contact? Yes. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. That, well, I guess that's part of the discussion. I, I I would say somebody else should be a backup to them in negotiating with Eversource because their language in their contract about how they're going to negotiate is very vague. Sounds like they would um, basically the letter being sent to Eversource is what starts the clock of getting the price. But they didn't sound like they wanted to actually get into any negotiation if, if say, Eversource came back and said it's 20000 instead of $14,000. Um, or if we wanted to push back and say, well, you, you know, you gave Pepperell a dollar a fixture, you know, that's the type of negotiation. I think that probably needs to be somebody from the board designated to be the contact for that type of information. But the letter only allows for one as far as I can read it. That's right. So what's your recommendation? I can add two. Yeah, we can right? add two. I can add a town rep and an RTE rep. Ah, right. Perfect. Good. Well, thank you, John and, and Jeff. Um, is there, quick, go ahead, Jeff. One other quick thing. Um, 
the other thing you need to think about is where we're going to store the inventory that we do accumulate, like for, for replacement parts. I don't know whether we do that out at the, I don't know, whether the maintenance shed or whatever. So uh, just be thinking about that one for, because I Maintenance didn't shed? I mean, well, I mean, you know, the, that? The, the, the part of the DPW or, okay. I don't, you know, so I, I don't know whether it goes with them or where we want to just, it's just a place to store it. So we got to have a place to put some lights, hmm. but there won't be much to have to put there. But, um, Good. Well, we'll, okay. we'll build a new pole barn just for that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, we <laughs> <laughs> um well thanks good so, so rick uh, and i'm sorry rick uh, jeff do you or john need any action from us tonight i don't think so john do we? I, well i think you need to agree as take a vote to sign that letter okay well, actually that's Forever's for next right. week anyway we just you asked for that two yeah, weeks i, I did yeah. say so yeah, i can so get more clarification forward. from esther um uh, i guess i i it's a Terry has given me a, a permission to talk with her in the past. I guess I should just ask if it's okay for me to continue to talk to Esther about that. I don't have a problem with that. Good. Yeah, you're all set. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Great. Well, we will uh, circle around again in a couple of weeks and get get this off the ground. Thank you. Great. Off Thank the good you work. Both. All right. And, and just so you know, it looks like we we may theoretically come in well below the allotted money that we've set up. The the grant that we asked for is forty eight thousand dollars. If if we get it, um, wow, there'll be excess money available to to fund a um, account for maintenance going forward, and there'll be extra money to pay for the college and electricity bill. <laughs> Good. Good. Okay. No, we we if that I think if your grant comes through, we will have a very positive set of numbers on that project. So um, and it's all even as it is now, it's a, it's a you know a reasonable uh, payback period. So yeah, I think I think it's uh, good either way. Now just uh, give Jeb a big heads up for you know thank you because he's done a lot of the lifting with all this inventory and looking at all the lights and driving to Pepperell and other places. But back Thank at you, John, because John helped a lot on the grant. So <laughs> it's a nice hefty grant. So. Thank you both for all the efforts for sure. It's been tremendous. Yeah. No, we we really appreciate it. And uh and your backing at town meeting was was proof of the pudding there that uh getting yeah. from a, a contentious issue to a unanimous vote was a real tribute to the hard work that you put in to really make a good case for people. Thank you. Absolutely. Great. Well, if uh, there's nothing else, we'll, we'll move on to our next item. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, John. Andrew, thank you, Jeff. Andrew, do you want John to stay on for the solar RFP discussion? Being oh, that he was sure. Yeah, review. that would be helpful. If you don't mind, do you mind staying around a little bit, John? I can charge you my overtime rate. <laughs> <laughs> We've And you're welcome to stay, Jeff, for any of it that you're interested yeah, in. I'd, I'd like to stay for that as well. So. Good. Um, well, we have our next appointment in five minutes for with Chad Flasinski, but because he is not here, um, do we have, can we do RFP in five minutes here or should we wait till after Chad? We have to start Chad's at 620 because it's a public hearing. Yes, yeah. okay. I would, I, Andrew, I think that there's a little bit more than five minute discussion there. So yeah, um, I, I would just suggest waiting. Uh, okay, if you don't mind waiting, then we'll, we'll try to knock off other, um, uh, Let's see. Item D. We were at D. Okay. The cloth community clothes clothing closet request to open one Saturday per month, nine to noon. Terry, what's I thought I thought they John. were open one one Saturday a month. No, that, that's actually my I, I didn't, didn't have to, didn't have to leave. Um so they have 
uh, used to be open, and then after COVID, they stopped being open. They feel like their um, hours need to be expanded again because they're underserving. They feel uh, I see no problem um, with figuring out how to get them in the building on Saturdays. Typically, they let people go through the food uh, bank, but because that's not open on Saturdays, we'll just have to set up a securitous route for them to get inside. Um, but I see no problem with doing that. They already have a key to the back door and the front door. So we'll just set up some type of a route for them to go through the election room into the ping pong room and back through that way if the people can't go down the back uh, steep entryway there um, at the back. Does the, does the public know how to navigate all that? Is there going to be signage put up for people to find their way to the clothing closet? I, I thought you were an expert at design. Wayfinding. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, well, there certainly will be something put up there. I'll be there for the first time that they do it to make sure we figure it out. And okay, I, that sounds good. That's an Rick, effect. any thoughts on your part? No, I'm good with it. If you need a motion, it's so moved that we approve that request. If you don't. All here, right, here. I'll, se I'll second that motion. And uh, are, are we're all in favor, Rick. Aye. Andrew is aye. And we are approving John to work with the clothing closet on uh, one Saturday per month opening. Um, Community Public Health Services regarding the Regional Opioid Shared Spending Plan. Terry, do you have more on that? Yes. Um, the CPHS Regional Health Services Group have met collectively and in total amongst the 15 towns. Let me just see if I find the total. I think it's over a nine year period, we'll receive a large sum of money that they hope to put to good um, via regional programs. I think they're estimating over the nine years, it will be a total of $623, $623,824. So they've come up with a plan to, um, in the first year, to offer three different programs. I just have way too many pieces of paper and they're looking for the select board support in each town. Um, our board of health reviewed the programs last week at their meeting and are hoping that the select board will support them as well. Um, it's a recovery project um, that will benefit recovery meetings in West and North County. There'll be some funding allocated to Moms Do Care funding, which will support pregnant women and parenting women and their families. And then there'll also be funds allocated toward the Center for Human Development, um, peer recovery coach request, and that will provide support for people who have yet to receive treatment or for those that are already in treatment. So rather than each town just trying to come up with approved uses, um, for example, Shelburne will have 55,000 in opioid funds collectively this year. Each town will pool their money and support regional programs to, to reach a greater population. The only one question I have about that, Terry, is on the last of the three projects you, you mentioned, Campaign for Human Development, is that the group that is providing that, that service? Center for Human Development, CHP. Center for Human, okay. The, the only reason I'm asking is that the group I'm familiar with that helps with people in recovery is called Clinical Support Options in Greenfield. And is CHD also in Franklin County or are they in Springfield? I couldn't tell you that. I'm not part of this discussion. I'm only bringing it forward for the Board of Health. Okay. And is there action that the select board needs to take on this, or are you just um, giving us an FYI? The action would be to support shared spending in a regional manner. Um, yeah, I mean, I think for recovery um, projects, I think that's that's a good idea. 
in in general i'm just i'm just a little curious about who the providers are and if they are if they're franklin county providers or not um i did attend just happened to attend last week's board of health meeting when this was discussed and that didn't come up andrew so i i don't know the answer and i don't think terry does um the Board of Health did discuss it, supported that decision rather than um, taking the individual amount allotted to Shelburne and trying to right. find a best way to do it, that the more bang for the buck kind of philosophy by grouping the money to this three-pronged project, um, and it had their full support. Um, I thought Fred, perhaps the chairman, would be here tonight, but I don't see him. Um, but I, I support their request to support that shared use decision. Good. Yeah, there yeah. is a meeting this Thursday for all of Franklin County and North Quabbin to talk about the programs. It's uh, the 23rd from 2 to 3 p.m. Would you rather postpone until you know whether they're regional? No, I think I'm, I'm willing to go ahead with it as, as this. Board of Health has proposed with it. I, I it's not. I'm unfortunately I'm not able to attend that meeting. So, uh, <laughs> that that is on me to not not be able to do that follow up. Um, so, is is there a motion needed in this regard? Um, I, th I think it would be nice to have a motion just supporting that the, the funds be shared regionally for the greater good. Mm -hmm. I moved. And I will second that. And is there further discussion? If not, we'll bring it to a vote. All in favor, Rick? Aye. Andrew is aye, and the motion carries. And do we have Chad Flasinski with us? No, I don't see him. I'm going to try to reach him by cell. He. Okay. And which is, uh, what transfer are we talking about? What's this it? What... The Hardy Eats. Oh, okay. And it, is he going into that space or is he just uh, trans taking their liquor license? He is going into that space and transferring the liquor license. Oh, okay. And is, does he have a restaurant? Yes. Oh, good. That's nice it's to hear. Page 21 of your packet, it's called... Um... Uh, hot fire uh, bar and grill hot fire bar and grill um i've seen on facebook he's published um first draft of a menu as well um it's very comprehensive sounds great good good all right um well i guess I think we'll he, have to hold that to another meeting if he's not here to present it It was a published in the recorder public hearing. Um, it does require him to be here for us to open it to the floor or no? Terry, what's your thought on that? He is signing in. Um, oh, okay. I think generally you do have to be present to get a liquor license.
we want to skip ahead to F or G while we wait. Okay. Sounded like he was in the restaurant. Huh. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yes, well, uh, F is the town of Charlemont regarding the transfer, renewal of our transfer station lease for a five-year term. Any Any controversy there, Terry? Nothing's changed in the lease, just the dates. And in their preamble, um, it does say that the use of property is intended for Charlemont and Shelburne residents only. Okay. So we have more, more foundation for our, our Shelburne first policy here. Yes. <laughs> Good. Um, Rick, any thoughts on that? Uh, I would move we... Uh renew the transfer station lease as presented in our packet. All right, and I will second that. And is there any further discussion? None. If none, we'll, we'll uh, take it to a vote. All, Rick, are, are you in favor? Aye. Andrew is aye, and the motion carries. And I see somebody on the phone. Is that Chad? It is, but it says I can't talk. No, I can, can you hear, hear you, me? Chad. Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, I am here. My apologies. Okay. Well, welcome, Chad. And uh, I understand you're starting a bar and grill in the at 24 Bridge Street. I am starting a bar and grill. Now, we're going to go from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., so we won't be a late-night bar and grill, that's for sure. Uh -huh. um, and my plan was to... Um, do draft beers a small selection of local brews uh for sale and then a company out of new york uh called wandering barman that i'm pretty familiar with they make like pre-made to go cocktails like cosmos and margaritas and things like that and i was hoping to be able to sell those along with those things and so really just kind of staying in the realm of like a quick service one and done style plate okay and that's a um so that would be a full liquor license then not just a wine and beer correct okay good and just out of curiosity if you're closing at six does that mean you're not serving dinner we are not serving dinner okay there will be some uh dinner like things that will be like available for takeout and kind of pick up on the way through but as far as like a dinner that okay really just trying to cater towards the lunch crowd here I see. Okay. Um, so, uh, Rick, do you have questions or concerns or thoughts for Chad? I have no questions or concerns. Okay. Uh, well, I will come back uh, to mine, which is, um, have you done all the requisite training for you and your staff to serve liquor? I have done the requisite training. My staff, not as of yet, because I haven't actually hired anyone. Um, those that will be serving liquor will be uh, TIP certified and able to regulate and judge appropriately. Great. Um, and have you had experience in the past in running a restaurant or, or serving liquor? So very much so. So uh, aside from I've kind of got my start in culinary in 1998, um, I did since as a waiter and a host here at the Cafe Martin, right where I'm opening up a restaurant. I also uh, ran the West End Pub for a while here in town. And then for the last three and a half years, I've been managing Crump and Fox and Zeke's Restaurant and you know, all of that. So uh, my experience runs up to about two million a year in annual revenue. Um, with about 60% of that coming from liquor sales because of the beer and the beer carts um, out on the course itself. Uh, but yeah, really, I mean, I've been in food service my whole life. That's literally all I do. That's great. Well, we're, we're pleased that to have somebody with uh, a lot of local experience in the restaurant trade and, and somebody who's got a lot of experience in the serving of liquor trade is, is always, uh, a comfort to the select board there to know that we're in good hands with people who are uh, having yeah. to manage that sort of thing. Uh, good. Terry, do you have any thoughts or concerns? No, his application is in order. And after this evening, um, I'll obtain your signatures on Wednesday and submit his application to Boston for review. Great. 
Um, well, this is a public hearing, so I'll open it up to the public in case anybody else has any things they want to say in regard to this liquor license. Are there any comments from the public? Hearing none, we'll, we'll move ahead. Um, uh, Rick, do you have uh, anything further or do you want to offer a, a motion in support of this transfer? I will move that we uh, approve the uh, transfer of the on-premise all alcoholic beverage license uh, to uh, Chad of Hot Fire Bar and Grill. And I will second that motion. And if there's no further discussion, we'll bring it to a vote. All in favor, Rick? Aye. Andrew is aye, and the motion carries. And you are in the liquor business, Chad. Yeah, thank you guys. <laughs> Much appreciated. All right. Well, good luck with your opening. Do you have an opening date or no? So the health board comes on Thursday and provided uh, the plumber from Jim Hawkins request is a good guy and does things to code. I suspect I should be open for this weekend. Um, oh, obviously, I won't, I won't have liquor until that gets approved, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and start without it. Like I said, I'm pretty lunch focused. I'm excited to be here. And my plan was to be here for the summer. So I am getting ready feverishly currently we are flooring about to put up a massive wall mural and uh the aesthetic will be set good well congratulations and good luck with your opening and i'm only sorry that i will be out of town this weekend but i will come and visit you when i return thank you guys very much for your patience i appreciate it all righty take care now thank you have a good night yeah you too bye-bye All right, we have done our public hearings and we're back to old business item A, which is the RFP for proposed solar array on the highway pole barn roof, award of contract. Um, Terry, were we able to get, I know you sent out the full proposal, but did, did we actually get any um, further information from uh, PV squared about their uh, the meaning of their number there. I did respond to you, but I didn't follow up with them personally. Um, as I mentioned, Greenfield Solar's proposal was clear in that they bid a, a price and then reflected what the rebates would be. Right. PV squared did not. They just. I'm assuming, but they didn't mention any kind of tax credit or rebate, so it's. Well, I don't. Yeah, I find it odd that that one did provide it um, uh, a request for a proposal with the uh, the bid portion. Um, you you put a number out there. That's what you're asking for the job, and. Um, they just went one extra step and said, by the way, after your rebates, it should be this um, and should be that is provided they all come through. So um, I don't think it's much of a stretch to assume that the two numbers that they provided as their bid proposal are anything other than that, the actual bid. Right. I guess the concern that I have is that I mean, I guess I look at it slightly differently from you, Rick, in that in that the the proposal included a request for services on the rebate, and we didn't get as much information there as perhaps we would have liked, though the solar store was a little bit more forthcoming on information about the rebate. And uh, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more in terms of nailing down their service in that regard, but because my view is that the rebates are a big chunk of the, pro that's 40% of the project, you know, um, and uh, so. But they also both did put in writing that we should consult our own tax attorney, <laughs> that they just said, here's what's out there, but we can't tell you if you're going to get it. They both kind of put that disclaimer in there. So uh, as they should, they're not they're not qualified to say, yes, you're going to get this. Um, no, but they are qualified as, as project proposers 
to say these are the project services that we will provide and and maybe we were not as as explicit as we should have been about what we were requesting there but I thought we were requesting more help on the on the back end of making sure that project was complete because in my mind a turnkey project includes that those services of saying you know we're going to help you with the paperwork Andrew, but neither did the Greenfield store actually say they would be helping with the paperwork. No, I, I agree with you. I'm, I'm saying we didn't get as much information as I would have liked in that regard. I don't disagree there. Yep. Um, John, do you have a recommendation on how to interpret these documents and where we should go with this? Well, can we take a step back because in our meeting last week, we were talking about some of the technical issues that I've been doing a little bit more research on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what it comes down to from looking at it is that we had one proposal that was coming in at approximately $3.09 a watt, I believe. The other proposal was coming in at about $2.39 a watt. I'm trying to. Mm, I think it was more like 324 and 294. 294, yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. So, um, but the 294 was for that expanded system, not for the original system on the south side. So, no, there was a there was a lower price for the expanded system, which was like 284 or something. I think it's right. It's all right here in the 294 was for the main proposal. And no. 278 was for the alternate on the north side. Okay. I, like I said, I have too many papers shuffling around. Um, and then the solar store, I think, was 324 per watt. So both, both proposers were proposing um, something called clipping. The uh, PV squared was proposing a 20 kW inverter for approximately 26,000, uh, 25.5 kW system. Um, so they were gonna take off five kW overall throughout the year, which is why their numbers are slightly lower. And then the solar system, uh, solar store rather, was proposing a 27.6 kW system on a 25 kW. So there's, when you start looking at some of the technical issues of how you want to shave, the most important thing is the number of um, what DC watts to AC watts. And there's an optimal over uh, oversizing, if you will, that's the word I was looking for, oversizing of the wattage on the roof that makes up the difference of getting more watts and more a higher efficiency on the inverters themselves. So the solar stores proposal at 25 kW to a 27 kW is a very small overage, typically 1.2 to 1.5% is added to the actual wattage for the inverter to the actual DC wattage because it's not so much where you're shaving during the midday, it's what happens during the off season when the peak peak is, the, is lower. And you wanna be capturing those as much wattage as you can uh, in order to increase your production. So what happens in that particular case is that the and, and bear with me, I, I didn't think this all the way through, I'm, I'm sorry, but the, um, the, the more, so, oh, geez, I'm sorry. Um, if I'm, when I start looking at the numbers there, the actual PV squared wattage to inverter ratio is better than the wattage to the, inverter ratio for the solar store, even though the 20, that was what I was concerned about is one was so much lower 
than the other one as far as the they're very similar in sizing, but one was five kW less than the other five kW you know, than the other system. I'm a little confused by that logic, John, because my and I can't claim to understand this whole clipping thing at all, nearly the way you're presenting it. But my sort of primitive understanding of it is that it's sort of the opposite. Of, my intuition is the opposite of what you presented. If if the solar store has a 25 kW inverter and a 27 something capacity on the roof, that that to me would indicate that their inverter has more capability to absorb those electrons than, than would a 20 kW inverter absorbing 25 kW of electrons. There's another piece that I didn't include, which is that during those off peak cycles, in order for the system to actually begin producing electricity, you have to have a lower ratio or higher ratio of wattage so the, the, the inverter, the, the panels are rated at 1,000 volts, but they don't start producing electricity until 3,000 volt, uh, 300 volts are starting to move through the system. A wider, lower 20 kW will actually start producing more, will start producing electricity sooner than a 25 kW system, or a 25 kW inverter will is what my understanding is i could be wrong on that but um so sooner in the morning you mean when you when the sun comes up yes so that's that was just the one thing i wanted to kind of res resolve in my own mind <clears throat> i did a i did do a quick ratio and um both of them theoretically if if to be at peak for the solar store, they would need to have gone to a 37.5 kW system. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and that would be at 20, right now, we would be at 27% with this, this PV squared, 27% ratio uh, compared to, to the um, slightly lower for the solar store. I know it's confusing. It's it's a lot of technical stuff, and I'm not sure I have my head completely wrapped around it, but it's been a while. I just want to point out that the, that is one of the differences. I know you had a concern about the overall production over 20 years, and there is a significant difference, uh, but at, annually it's a 8% difference between what the solar store is proposing and what the PV squared is proposing. The solar store is going to give us 8% more power. Yes. That, seem, that seems like a significant amount to me. Yeah, comparing one was um, over 20 years, it was eight, 824,968 kilowatt hours for a solar store and 752,427 for the uh, PV squared. That's the eight percent difference. That's twenty five years. Twenty. Twenty years. What do we? What's what's that mean in dollars and cents in some measurable way that makes sense to the public? Well, if that's that's about sixty or seventy thousand kilowatts, you're saying is yes. the difference. Yes. So so just by way of reference, Rick, my seven. KW system on my roof that provides home power to me has been operating for about eight years now and has produced about that much power, about 65,000 kilowatts. So that's about eight years of power for one household. Is that, is that square with your estimating there, John? I think so, yeah. Um... You know, current rate is 14 cents a kilowatt hour. So if changing it into a dollar per, I have to do the math in my, I can't do the math in my head these days. So the difference here over 20 years would be one, one home. One home for eight years, yeah. 
no for one. Yeah. Give me a okay. Second. You said yours has been in eight years. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. It doesn't seem significant to me as it doesn't seem as significant as a 16% higher bid <laughs> does. That seems quite significant to me. $14,550 difference. I, uh, how do we how do we tell the taxpayer that spending another fourteen thousand five hundred and fifty dollars for one over the other is offset by uh, that projected number of kilowatt hours? Just keep in mind that this process was based on the technical proposal first, followed by the price. So we would have to have good reason. Um, if, I mean, they scored fairly close. Well, there were four reviewers, um, two edged out in favor of one of the vendors. The other two edged out in favor of the other vendor. So to me, that's a 50-50 split. We sat there and looked at each other because it was so close, um, trying to figure out what the determination was. We all regretted not being able to get the dollars uh, to know, to put some perspective on the difference um, as to what possibly would weight in favor of one over the other. And our vote, we didn't really wanna take, but we had no choice. So we took a vote to pick one pending review of the dollars and cents. Now that we have the dollars and cents, according to our own previous vote, a 16%, just shy of $15,000 difference to me is a significant, really good reason um, to reconsider. John, what's your thought about that? I think I can't remember where you came down in our previous meeting, but. Uh... I recuse myself from making any per preference because I have a relationship with one of the vendors, but. I, I think I said I. You cannot go wrong with either proposal technically. Um, yeah, I think the understanding is that one one of the the proposers with the Selectria um, inverters and panels, um, Solar Edge, apparently is has not has lost some of its glamour in the industry um but that seems to be more on a national level like again i think the local contractor has been responsive to the system currently that they've installed and we have had no issues with that particular i believe it's the same panels on on the um town garage um so again to me it, it's your decision as to what financially is one better than the other and long term they both seem very equal with with their long term plans of how they're going to maintain it what their warranties periods were all were very similar so um that's why i scored them very close by like that less than a half a point i think mm -hmm. i think one of the things that uh, was a big factor um Andrew, for you was um, um, retirement, potential for retirement, who was going to be around to take care of our system for the duration of its lifespan. Um, and one of the bidders is a, is a community um, cooperative. Um, I think they have the uh, best shot for longevity in that case. But still, I wish somebody could, could tell me if $14,550 is offset with that potential long annual basis, um, take the 20 year figure and divide it, divide it into a, a year, um, is, is it worth making that a benefit or a detriment? Um, because 70 kilowatts doesn't tell me anything. <laughs> And again, John Q. Public is who we have to answer to, and I'd like to, I'd like to know that hey, um, our original 
leaning was going to be um, a 16% higher, 16 plus percent higher dollars out, but we see the benefit in the uh, production coming back forward. But I can't make that determination and I was hoping that John or maybe Jeff can. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have the, uh, I agree with you, Rick. I think that was a concern that I that I shared in the previous meeting, just in terms of the overall management of the system. Um, but uh, the on the other score of the $14,000 difference in price, it's a little bit, as John has pointed out, apples to oranges in terms of what you're getting with each proposal because the higher cost proposal is also going to produce more energy which is going to produce more value over time and the question i don't have the answer for you rick is what is the exact value of that extra energy in today's dollars and i'm only using my own system as a, a sort of rough approximation but because my system uh you know earns money i mean generates that power behind the meter i don't have an exact amount in terms of how much value that represents each year in cost of electricity i don't know rick uh if jeff you, do you have that number um well if if john's right that it's it's like sixty thousand. K, um, and if we said like 14 cents a kilowatt, that's $8,400 a year difference in savings. Yeah, so, I'm sorry, sorry, Jay. 8,400 total over the over the 20 years. So okay. John, John, John was saying that it was 60,000 extra um, K that was being produced. And if you're, if you use 14 cents, say, as the price, I don't know what the going rate is right now, but um, that's about $8,400. So it would really have to double to the. So the then, price. so then the PV squared number is still, still $5,500 to the good there, not 14,000, but still all slightly but better. Still slightly better. Doing a quick, quick calculation, it's about at 14 cents a kilowatt hour, it would be $377 a year um difference in in dollars 370 yeah 370 three call it three 380 rounding it up times 20 years so that's 7400 dollars 7600 dollars at 380 but yeah ballpark yeah so I'm, I'm thinking closer to 8,400 total divided. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, so a long ways off from 50. So PV squared is still five to six thousand dollars to the good, then. Right. Yeah. Yep. So, so then the question becomes you know, is, is that extra power that we get uh, as solar power, you know, worth spending? the extra $5,000 for over 20 years. I don't know. Yeah. But John, and, John, uh, the inverters are different. Like, would it help PV squared if they went to a larger inverter? It's, it's past that negotiation. You can't can't go back and ask them to change what they submitted. Right. But I mean, if, if they were already the better deal and, and it actually still could pick up that extra slack, then they'd even be a better deal. <laughs> so it's like, it can we well, no, because a, a bigger inverter is going to cost more money. Right, right. But and that's, the it's the, it's the, much. that ratio that's important in that aspect, because you, the most you can get out of the dollars per watt that you can bleed out of a system wrong terminology saying bleed but the most you can the, the lesser amount you have to spend for the inverter compared to how much you're getting out um, is really the critical piece okay yeah. well put so john it sounds like you're saying that solar store oversized their inverter i would say just the opposite well oversized yeah i guess it's six you know which way you're looking at the cup um they could have that that size inverter could have taken up to 37 uh, kW instead they're proposing 27 kW 
Right. Whereas the inverter that solar uh, PV squared could maximum it would take at the ratio would be about 27.6 kW. Uh, I'm sorry, 25 kW. It would be the maximum that they would want to put in there anyway. So that's our limit, and that's what we asked them to bid on. Is that not correct? Yes. Well, yeah, I so think the, the offer. I, I'm just curious, what's a, what would be the point of having a, a more expensive, larger inverter yeah. if future, it... Future expansion, but based on the layouts, there's not much more you're going to be able to put on that roof to begin with. Yeah. At least not on the south side, yeah. <laughs> right. And north side, that's just silly. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, and is Terry, are you still with us? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Where would I go? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not, I didn't see you on my screen there. So. <laughs> I, I have I have a split screen here. I'm looking at the agenda and the and the tiles. Um, so, uh, and Terry, you, you mentioned a concern about us sort of changing hor horses from one meeting to the next. Or, you know, what do, what's your thought on that? I feel as though the scoring was close enough. I think it was within three points overall between the two. And I did confirm with procurement that, you know, it's close enough that we could evaluate once we knew cost. So if, if the board is leaning to PV square, I'd say that's where you should go. If it is the most advantageous system for that site. Yeah, well, because we don't really have a, a a comprehensive plan for solar in terms of looking down the road, we're just looking at it project by project. Um, I, I guess I'm in agreement with Rick that we're slightly to the good by going with PV squared, and uh, though the the difference is 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 marginal, and uh, and we get slightly more power if we go with if with the solar store but it'll cost us five or six thousand dollars more um over 20 years to to go in that direction um so i don't know rick you want you wanted to move with the with the lower upfront cost there and the smaller amount of power Well, I was I was hoping somebody could open my eyes um, because that 16% just stuck in my craw. I said, you know, I, when I'm asked, I want to have an answer. And um, I think I think you've done very well, John um, and Jeff, for your input there to um, really put it into something where I think you can get a handle on it. Um, and having them been so close. Um, and us uh, leaving room to change in the original vote based when we saw the prices because they were so close um, that we could have picked one or the other that previous time. It didn't really matter. We just needed to get to the next step where they could give us the numbers. With those numbers in hand, um, I'm more comfortable in going with PV squared personally, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm willing to go with you on this one, Rick. I, I to me, there it's not a 16 percent, it's more like four, well, four or five percent. Once you, you know, you even out the apples and the oranges, you know. Um, but given that it's you know, four or five percent to the better, you know, sure, let's let's do that. Then I would move we uh, award the contract to PV Square for the solar at the highway pole barn. All right, I will second it. And if there's no further discussion, any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll bring it to a vote. All in favor, Rick? Aye. Andrew is aye, and the motion carries. All right, well, one down. Hope I didn't com confuse you too much. No, that I'm glad you were. You added your pieces there, John. <laughs> Uh, Andrew, could I ask that we jump to item H under new business? Um, the gentleman, Daniel Kramer, has been waiting for a while. Oh, 
Sure. Uh, Thank you. Oh, H is the other element brewing. Uh, yes. One day liquor license. Um, great. Uh, Daniel Kramer, welcome. Hi there. Thanks for uh, moving the schedule ahead for me. Not a problem. Uh, do you want to tell us a little more about your project? Um, I don't have too much to inform you about. Uh, Apex has invited us to um, pour during two of their events. Um, so they're really spearheading this. Um, they they set up a, uh, they're going to set up an area for us, um, but we're going to be providing the, the beer. Um, okay, so great. And it sounds like you have your own uh, serving business where you are, so you're familiar with all the all that's required in the serving of liquor. Yeah, yeah, been in the business a long time. Good. Uh, well, we've just approved a a, a similar one day uh, permit for August thirty first. What what's the date of your event? So we're doing two two dates, uh, September first and September eighth. Okay. Um. Rick, do you have anything further on on this one? No, same as the previous. Apex uh, does a great job in running it and picks uh, good local responsible uh, vendors for them. They have the proper history behind them, so I would move approval of this uh, two day. Actually, it's a one day permit covering two different days. That would be the first and the eighth, wasn't it? Yes, of September. Okay, I will second that motion. And uh, yeah, I agree. I think Apex has done a nice job with these. And I think West County Winery has been their, their go-to in previous years, but it's nice they're mixing it up. Um, if there's no further discussion, we'll bring to a vote. All in favor, Rick? Aye. Andrew is aye, and the motion carries. Thank you, Daniel. Good luck with your event. Thank you very much. Appreciate All right. your time. <laughs> Have a great evening. Thank yeah, you. All right. Um, what do we have? We have just Jim Perry left. Is that the only thing? On no, the... we're in new business item A. Oh, right, right. Sorry about that. We're at uh, personnel policy re revision regarding on-call status. Um, where do we stand with that, Terry? Um, this is the language that Donna recommended. Um, so that there's parameters when an employee is put on call. I thought her wording was excellent and um, could have uh, could have helped us in a previous instance. Um, and I like that she noted that um, uh, that we wouldn't be uh, obligated to compensate employees um, when this is enacted. So I didn't see a downside to it. It's page 24 in your PDF packet if you're looking for it, Andrew. Um, yeah. Donna. Whoop. Um, yeah, I did read it when it was emailed to me. I'm just not seeing it in the packet, but um, yeah, I was comfortable with the language when I read it. Um, so, uh, Rick, if you're in agreement, um, you want to move that? I would move that we accept the recommended change to our personnel policy with regard to restricted on-call status. Great, I will second that. Is there further discussion? No. Hearing none, we'll bring it to a vote. All in favor, Rick? Aye. Andrew is aye, and the motion carries. Um, good. And then we have... Uh, item G, I think. Is, is G the three? only thing left here? Uh, yes, and one item under other business. Okay. Um, is Jim Perry here? No, he's not. Okay. And and where does he want to put this wooden sign that says Deerfield River? As you're walking up Bridge Street, the, the town-owned ravine 
where we have the railing. Yes. The open space committee voted to put the sign on the railing so that people knew that the river was the Deerfield River. Okay. Uh, I, opposite Mechanic Street. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't have an objection to that part of the town. I, I feel like the the part down where Deerfield Avenue is, you know, one, you're looking right at the river. And so it feels like, you know, we don't need more signs down there. And two, we just have so many signs in the middle of town now that I'm, I'm, uh, but if, if they want to label that overlook the Deerfield River, I'm okay with that. That's, uh, okay. he's done a beautiful, done a beautiful sign. Um, it is a nice looking sign. Yeah. And it's small. Yeah. 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 Good. I don't have. If you're in agreement, Rick, we can. You want to move that one? If it needs a motion, I move that we authorize the Open Space Committee to install the river sign on Bridge Street. I will second that um, discussion. I think, Terry, that we do need to move these things, right? Do we need to approve signs in town? I would say signs, yes. The Open Space Committee had already voted to move forward with the sign, but I told Jim it would be best if the board also approved it. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, if there's no further discussion, we'll vote. All in favor, Rick? Aye. Andrew is aye, and we have a new sign up at, at the Overlook. Um, since we're transitioning to other business, I do have a little information about that kind of signage. Um, I was, uh, this weekend, I was uh, digging perennials on the Bridge of Flowers, and um, Jim Richardson agreed to help me uh, transport them to his house, where he's going, uh, we dug up a whole truckload of about 60 or more perennials that uh, Linda Leitner donate or directed me to dig up, uh, um, to donate to the, Pocket Park when when it's when we're ready to have gardens there and in the meantime, uh, Jim is going to host them at his house. Um, and um, as we were finishing that project, Jim mentioned that he has some planed big two foot wide boards that are two inches thick that he said he would donate to the town if we could find somebody to letter them because we were looking at the sign on the wall of the of the um rod and gun club that uh talks about the the treaty at the deerfield at the potholes you know which is in pretty bad shape it's kind of coming apart and losing its legibility um so i said i would sort of cast around and see if there's somebody who has a router or wants to take on that lettering project um so it seems like maybe the the open space committee might be a group that would uh, be able to help us with that if they are in in the project of making wooden signs. Um, but uh, anyway, I just wanted you all to know that that's a sign that's that's falling apart that uh, Jim Richardson has uh, offered to donate some wood, and um, he mentioned the name of a person who's I don't have in front of me. Um, who might help us to sort of join up three pieces of that big barn board or something to make a similar sized um, sign board for to to uh, refresh that that uh, pothole treaty sign there. That would definitely be great. I think Jim actually made the one that uh, is pictured in our packet for the Deerfield River. Um, but I don't know that he, he would be willing to take on a project because I think there was a lot of text on the one you're referring to, right? Yeah, no, he wasn't, he wasn't, I didn't hear him volunteer to re-letter that sign, but, but he did create the Deerfield sign? Yes. Jim Perry did. Oh, Jim Perry. Yeah. Oh, okay. Perry. No, I was talking about Jim Richardson, but. Oh, no. Yeah. Jim Perry. Oh, well, maybe Jim Perry would take it on. I don't know. I was thinking it might make a. A Mohawk student or a tech school student might want to earn some skills with the route. It might take us four years if we get the tech school to do it. But uh, <laughs> so I don't know if, if we want to go down that road. But 
anyway, I, I'm just, if you know of anybody who uh, is handy with a router and wants to uh, create a, a new historic sign for us, uh, we have the wood, um, thanks to Jim Richardson, so. There is actually a guy in Greenfield who does signs. Um, he runs the triathlon, the Greenfield Triathlon, Rick Roy. Um, he was a photographer. Um, his wife is Kay. She was, was the librarian until recently, or the children's librarian in Greenfield. He mm. has a uh, computerized router and makes cribbage boards, personal customized cribbage boards. He certainly has the capacity to do it. And I do follow him on Facebook and I see similar style things he's actually done. Now, whether they were commissioned or don donated, I don't know, but. Um, uh, well, I, if we I, can I, find I, some I, funding, we might hire somebody like that to uh, make reach a sign. Out to see what he thinks. Okay, yeah, good. Well, let me know what you find out. I will. Okay. Good. Well, projects just crop up here and there all the time. Terry, you had another <laughs> other business project? Uh, yes, I, I had mentioned that I would bring up um, Holly Sontag's concern on 21 Church Street and wasn't sure if either one of you had had an opportunity to go out and take a look at the area of sidewalk and adjoining wall that she's speaking of. I did actually look at that um, last Friday and it's right around the corner from my house. And the question that I have, because there's a wall on either side of her house, the, the wall that's um, nearest to Mechanic Street um, abuts her little garden below. And then there's about I don't know, maybe five feet of grass and then the sidewalk. When I looked at that, that part of the wall seemed in reasonably good shape. Yeah, it's and even, the other side. And it's oh, the so the other side is closer to the culvert that runs under the road. And right. that wall is more angles in toward the sort of a, the, the bridge of the culvert. And right. And at that point, it's quite close to the sidewalk, so yep. I wasn't I wasn't quite sure what she had in mind over there, um, because it's mostly concrete over there with the culvert and the wall and the the in between. Um, there's no grass or anything. It's it's uh, well, there there is a little grass, but I I can fill you in. Yeah, um, you go up and I. Um, texted her ahead and she met me there okay. um, um as you said it's kind of a, a diagonal short wall maybe 10 feet between yeah. the culvert and her house it's attached at both ends it's attached on her foundation and it's attached on the culvert um her question was who owns it because the contractors that she wants to use were very reputable um contractors um she needs to excavate that uh, portion of her front of her foundation, which constantly has a water drainage problem. So if you look uphill of the culvert, the sidewalk, any rainwater, snow melt comes down the sidewalk across the culvert and drops to the, to the wall onto her, basically her lawn, goes up against her house, goes down, comes into her basement. So she's trying to rectify that. But when she had a contractor say, well, if I dig out to try and seal your foundation and put in a French drain to divert the water, um, that wall has already got a, a bow in it. Um, it looks like over the decades, the freezing and thawing cycle have <laughs> worked its magic and bowed it out a bit. Um, they had concern about it and they said, I won't, both of the contractors she talked to so far don't want to tackle it until she could answer who owns the wall. And she didn't know how to pursue it. So I took five minutes or less and went on to the registry of deeds and her deed. Um, it has not actually been surveyed, literally, um, 
but it's um, a written verbal deed, which says her property begins at the um, corner of the brook and follows the brook, which means all of that, that wall is hers, not ours. So I think there's a legitimate concern because as you said, I think there's maybe five feet between the sidewalk and her foundation. Um, my first thought was, well, why don't, she, why doesn't she just raise up the ground level so that water continues <laughs> down the sidewalk, but it would be above her sill. So she doesn't have enough foundation there to do that. Um, so I, un I understand the problem uh, needs to be addressed, but if they're excavating eight feet down, to expose her foundation with a five foot space to the sidewalk, there's some concern for the sidewalk too. Um, I would assume the contractor liability would kick in, but I don't, I don't know how you could stop someone from trying to rectify uh, an ongoing constant um, drainage issue um, with a fear. Um, uh, she did speak to um, Mark Shippey, who looked at it and said, I think you should proceed with caution, tell the contractor to proceed with caution. Um, I think that was probably pretty good advice um, now that it seemed clear to me. And I told her, I said, look, I'm no lawyer. <laughs> Confirm it to make yourself really comfortable or pass it on. But I sent her a copy of her deed, which um, she didn't know she had or didn't have access to or where to find it. Um, and uh, it's, it's straight straightforward. I'm pretty sure that sh short section of wall is entirely on her property, even though it's attached to the culvert that brings that stream under the road. It also meets up with our sidewalk too, doesn't it? I don't think so. I think it, it's the abutment of the um, culvert. But the sidewalk goes right over the culvert right there. There's no real, there's no verge or anything there. It's just concrete wall and sidewalk, isn't it? Yeah, well, the grass and goes- The reason I'm saying it that way is because the other question I have about it is if, if she were to start working on her project and the wall were to fail, it would probably take the sidewalk down, wouldn't it? It, it would have that potential or the contractors wouldn't have refused to look at it um, or work on it until it was decided whose wall it is. So I did what she asked, tell me who owns this. I said, there's a document that I think answers your question. Consult someone and find out if that's fact, um, short of having an actual surveyor come out because there, there aren't, um, I mean, it's, it's an older home and it's apparently never been surveyed. And it says kind of goes this way along the brook to a point and then turns this way. It's, it's, it's not like, uh, you know, my acreage is surveyed with pins and marks and I can walk the line for you, but right. in town that's tougher. So I answered her question, I think, um, but left it to her to decide how to proceed. But yeah, I, I think that its potential if, if that wall did go over, that it could undermine the sidewalk. But I, the contractors that she told me she's having looked at it, I wouldn't worry about them putting it back together for her to uh, maintain the integrity of our sidewalk. I doubt, I doubt it could cause the sidewalk to collapse, but they were pretty sure that they were, there was a possibility that that wall itself may, because as I said, it's already bowed out. Um, but the bow is um, right. more than halfway on her side of the toward her well, that house. Was, side. That was sort of the operative question, you know, because if if the sidewalk were to fail, I mean, the, if the wall were to fail um, and it doesn't harm the sidewalk, then it's just up to her to replace it because uh, because it's um, her wall. Uh, the question it raises is what if she says, well, I don't really feel like replacing it. I'm just going to take it down, which was kind of the Mike Skalski approach over in Buckland when he bought the pizza place and the town told him, oh, your wall there on North Street is failing. You need to fix it. And Mike said, well, I don't really want to fix it. That's too expensive. 
And the town said, well, it's your wall. And then Mike's Mike's response was, well, I'll just take it down then. <laughs> and the town said, well, town changed its tune because the wall was holding up North Street, you know? So, yeah. uh, you know, I think that's, that's to me is, is the question is, is can we as the town live without that wall if it came to that? I would hope we don't need to answer that question, but I don't know that we have any say in it at this point. If, if we thought it was our wall, then we'd have some say in it. Um, she's, she's got a legitimate drainage problem that is, is, as I say, coming down the street and sidewalk and dumping onto her, her lawn at a lower grade level than the sidewalk. And that can't be rectified by bringing that grade up to keep the water going elsewhere. It's got to be, it's got to be dealt with. Or her foundation is in jeopardy at some point. So, I can see she felt between a rock and a hard space. Um, <laughs> it's a rock. It's a rock. Wall. rock. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. Um, so I don't know. Um, I told well, her that. Haven't heard from her since. So. Thank you for doing all that research there. That was very helpful. Um, Terry, do you have any thoughts on what Rick has shared there? Uh, Mark had suggested a site visit for everyone to go. Um, I don't know. It sounds like you've both been there. Well, I, I would personally like to go there with Mark and ask him those questions. Like if, if the sidewalk, I mean, if the wall fails or if Holly decides not to replace it after learning the expense of what it would take to rebuild it you know i i think those are the questions he should really be there to advise us about you know mm -hmm. i did go up the day she brought that to us which i think was thursday um and i happened to catch her at home um and um i did reach out to mark and i have not heard back from him uh to see if he had more input based on what I had found. Uh, so yeah, I, I'd be happy to go up again with him, but uh, they're not, she's not asking for anything from us at this point, um, but it might behoove us to take a closer look at it just for ourselves. Um, I, could, I could look at it tomorrow after work I mean, sorry, Wednesday after work, if if Mark is available in the afternoon. All right, I'll ask him. Okay. Um, uh, what's after work? I have a credit union board meeting at six on Wednesday. Um, 4.35, I mean. Oh, I can do that. I'm gonna shoot for earlier because Mark's day ends at 2.30, so 4.30, yeah, I'll ask. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Uh, Let us know if that's gonna happen. Okay. That would be great. Thank you, Terry. We do, have to, we do have to go onto her land to see this. Should we ask her advisor oh, yeah. that we come take a look? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Good. Um, any other other business? Is that it, Terry? That's it. Okay. Um, any correspondence? Seeing none. Any public comment? I think our public, Jeff, you're the only member of the public still here. <laughs> Uh, well, if there's no public comment, we'll move to adjourn. Rick? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. And we are, and I am I, and we are adjourned. Thank, Thank you. Thank you all. Guys. All right.